into the presence of God. And it's like the old song, uh, turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. When we're singing and we're worshiping, something's happening where the things of the world are growing strangely dim and the things of the Lord are becoming bright and alive. And in that atmosphere, we can't conjure it up. We can't make it, psych it, whoop it up. We can't. We worship him and we praise him regardless of what's going on. I'm teaching you right now as a pastor. This is good teaching. It's better than the sermon. But as we, as we lift him up in praise, something of God draws close. And then he ministers to the needs of the stuff that's been going on. In the midst of his presence, that's where peace and healing and wholeness and encouragement and inspiration and conviction and discipline, all that happens in his presence, right? So that's what, that's what we desire to do. If you're able and comfortable, let's start standing together and then as you want to sit later, that, 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 that's fine. But let us, oh, I didn't bring my glasses. This is our call to worship. We exalt you, our God, the King. We praise your name forever and ever. Every day, O oh God, we will praise you and extol your name forever and forever. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. The Lord is good. He is good to all. He has compassion on all that he has made. Your works, O oh God, they praise you. Your faithful people, we extol you. We will tell of the glory of your kingdom and we will speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, O oh God. We know this. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all his promises. He is faithful in all that he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and the Lord is faithful in all that he does and the Lord is near. He is near to all who call to him. He is near right here. Lord God, we thank you for your nearness. We invite your presence through our praise. Have your way. Even the atmosphere of our gathering is different than it was when we first started. And your presence makes all the difference in the world. And we're trusting you, oh God, to hear our prayer and to receive each prayer request. We thank you, Lord God. You know the reason Jake comes. We anoint him with oil and we trust your touch upon him to advance him forward wherever he is. Christ's name. We anoint Kathy on behalf of her mother. Her mother's back and hips have been bothering her for a long time. And Lord, you healed my hips when I said, pain be gone, in the name of Jesus. And we speak for Kathy's mother, pain be gone, in the name of Jesus. Set her free and bring glory to your name. We look forward to this testimony. And Lord, we pray for Kathy herself. She's got some private needs. We just ask, oh God, an anointing and a healing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Joel, I anoint you. The Lord gave you a promise. 
you would not need surgery. That tells me he's working. And in the name of Jesus, we claim healing. We claim healing in the name of Jesus. Anoint our brother Joel. Accomplish in him all that you desire. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus, we anoint Teresa. We thank you, Lord, for her testimony last week that there was a private prayer that she had and you delivered her and set her free of something for years and years. Lord, we're not, we don't know exactly what she's coming for anointing for, but she's wanting, I'm sure, all the healing and all the peace and all the work of your spirit within her. In the name of Jesus, we speak healing and wholeness over Teresa. We praise you, Lord God. We trust you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for my brother, Joe. We trust you, Lord, with his life. And we're speaking a healing in the powerful name of Jesus Christ over his life. And we're thanking you and trusting you. Show forth your glory. Once again we pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. our living Lord and Savior. You can accomplish in her, even at her age, you can do great things. We pray for a healing touch to, you, to, to, to your name's glory. We thank you so much. Thank you for the trust that Caroline has in you. And we come to you to accomplish a miracle even in the name of Jesus our Lord. speak, O oh God, the manifestation of your Spirit's gifts that only you can do. We bless you, Lord God. We trust you, Lord God. Minister with every need and concern. We pray for a wholeness even in regards to the grieving process. And make her strong, we pray in Jesus' name. you for her. She comes to you trusting in your power and your work and your touch upon her. And so in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray for that touch. We pray for that healing. And we worship you for it. And we will testify to your great goodness. Bring a healing, bring a touch, bring an encouragement in Jesus' name. Thank you for the recent baptism in the Holy Spirit, the infilling that you've done in Rachel. Thank you for the transformation that this process that she is on, and we anoint her for the need she's talking about that might be private to her. And we just trust, Lord God, in your fullness, in your completeness, your wholeness upon Rachel and all her family. Justin, we know, Lord God, that you are at work in his life and in his family. We thank you, Lord God. And so in the name of Jesus, we pray for a healing. The 
they say it can't be done, but in the name of Jesus Christ, you can bring yes. a complete healing. We agree. We agree. You can bring a complete healing even now because, Lord, you're birthing a sense of direction, a sense of call, a sense of ministry. Yes. And so, Lord, we pray for that powerful testimony that he will have in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I suspect we are going to hear testimony of God's goodness. Did I tell you the time? I did. We don't always know when the Lord does his work. Lord, for the rest of us, I don't even know if this is theologically correct, but I'm going to do it. I anoint myself on behalf of this congregation. We pray, Lord God, that you would accomplish in us all that you desire. We know, Lord God, that you are not through with this congregation. There is great days ahead. We trust, Lord God, for the way you're going to guide our next leader. And we lift them up before you and we pray, Lord God, your anointing even wherever they stand or sit right now. We pray that you would birth a sense of call. We pray that you would birth within them a hunger and a thirst for all that you have. And we pray, Lord God, that you would just bring, bring to us the pastor that you have for us. And Lord, may that pastoral leader, whoever they are, come into a congregation that's full of the Spirit. May they come into a healed congregation in the sense of mind and emotions and relationships. I speak wholeness and peace on this whole congregation that's here, that's online, that's in our area, that's associated, that's still at home with the COVID concerns. I pray, Lord God, for, for uh, unity unity. I pray, Lord God, for healing among any, any issues that are going on between us. I just pray, Lord God, that the condition of this church family is ready to roll as our new leader comes. Do your work in us, we pray. Do your work in us, we pray. Amen. Well, Pastor, I'm, I'm thankful for God's consistent love and uh, closeness. And um, I, uh, I went up to see my uncle a couple days ago, and on the way home, I felt the Lord prompted me to go see a friend, and I stopped in to see a friend of mine that I work with, and... Uh, I wanted to share with him uh, something that uh, God did to me. And uh, I don't know if he's a believer or not a believer, but um, I, I just felt I needed to share something with him. And um, that thing that I wanted to share with him was this, that uh, for four or five or six weeks, my, my back has been really uh, painful stinging and hurting uh, certain movements were really 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 bad and um, I've always been the kind of guy that in my Christian life I would rather pray for anybody else than myself I, I would spend 10 hours praying for you but I, I have a hard time praying five minutes for myself because I'm wondering if it's for selfish gain or is it right or is God in it and should you and so it's just so much easier for me to uh, be concerned about others in some sense I'm not trying to present myself as over, overly godly I'm presenting myself as a Christian that's a little mixed up but in that uh, last Sunday morning I was praying at home and reading in scriptures and I asked God to touch my back uh, just to remove the pain and I was sincerely seeking him to do that and um, it was good I was watching some other preachers on TV and 
Anyways, I came to church and I was uh, thinking about my situation a little bit. And so when, when the service was over, I, when I got up and started to walk out, uh, um, uh, Travis Dusso was sitting there and God prompted me to go over and see Travis. And so I, I don't want to conjure up something that God's going to be involved in and then it's manipulated and never let me do that God and so anyways I, I was just small talking with Travis and talking about God's goodness and he said is there anything wrong with you and I said there is my, uh, my back has been been hurting me for, for a long long time my lower back and uh, he says well we need to go pray and so we, we prayed and, and uh, he prayed three, three or four times because the pain didn't really go away in my back, and and um, we prayed and prayed, and, and uh, I prayed. And uh, anyways, uh, Sunday afternoon, my back uh, stopped hurting, and it hasn't hurt w one moment uh, since last Sunday. And I know that's a hard thing for. It's a hard thing to prove that God did something like that to a lot of people, but he proved it to me. And it's as real as real can be. In fact, Monday I thought I'd better go golfing to make sure uh, that it's fixed. And uh, Dave, I didn't play very good, by the way. I had 80 and 89, but you know what? It didn't hurt. And I, I just, uh, I, I'm just excited that I could share that with some non-believers this week. And uh, they asked me about my back, and I expressed to them that it was purely God's love and goodness and kindness. And so uh, if he's got to hurt me to help me to help others, have at it. If you allow me to be hurt to help others, have at it. I'm not blaming God for pain or bad backs, but he uses all things for good for those that love him and uh, he's been speaking to me in the last um, month or so and uh, it's uh, it's a great encouragement to me um, and I hope and pray that that encouragement will indeed help others either find Christ or uh, reinvigorate their love for him and I just praise him today. My mother. You know what her last three words were? I do. I have four siblings, or three siblings, three sisters that are older than I. I'm the youngest of four. And uh, my mother said, I love you, I love you, I love you. For Debbie, for Dawn, and for Day. She couldn't quite get out the fourth one. <laughs> Thank you, Gina, for laughing. <laughs> but you know, sometimes things happen that like uh, affect you emotionally that are really unintended. I don't know why I thought of that, but it's like, you know, there, if the enemy can use the simplest things, my mom is communicating love on the way out the door, and she communicates her love to Debbie, to Dawn, to Day. Uh, isn't that terrible? Of course, she was communicating her love to me as well. But love, isn't that interesting? Um, not all, you know, we never know what last words are, and of course, last, we've been gifted with that. Um, I love you, I love you, I love you. Why, why would my mom want to communicate that to us kids? I knew it already. Don't you know your mom's love? Don't you miss taking them to the doctor's appointment? <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't say stuff like that. I have a confession to make. There have been times when I've gone, oh, Sonia, can't you take her this time? 
you know, in a weird kind of way, I wouldn't mind taking my mom to the doctor tomorrow. Isn't that weird? Why? Love does some things. You see, love is not a one, one and done thing, is it? Love endures. Love endures forever. So the context of this message is going to be on words of love. But particularly one, one particular word of love, and you can probably figure out what that word's going to end up being. But in the Gospel of John, chapter number 15, um, the first 17 verses, the first 10 are all about one concept, and then the other, the other remaining uh, seven are about another concept, but then there's something in the middle of both of those that speaks about ask whatever in the Father's name or in Christ's name. Ask whatever. Like, this, this is about answered prayer. Do you want your prayers answered positively? Don't you? Well, this is like one of the one way to look at this message has something to do with answered prayer. And then the question is going to draw toward where does your love live? Where does your love dwell? Where, where do you place your love? How, how do you love kind of a thing? Now, this is, these are Greek concepts of love, and there's actually eight of them. I always have been told there's like uh, you know, different numbers. Uh, eight, eight concepts of love. What's it? Yeah, see, see those? Now, now, the ones in green show up in the Bible, in the New Testament. The ones in white, they don't show up in the New Testament. I should say that the one on the bottom, the, the store J or store, store gay on the bottom with only one asterisk, that really doesn't show up in the positive. It shows up in, in, in the negative. Like, uh, um, don't be unloving. That's how it shows up, but it, un, like an unstorge. Okay, so I'll just give you that. But all right, here's, here's these eight words of love. You've seen, you may have seen these. Have you seen all eight before? I, I hadn't. There's a couple of them that, uh, that were new to me. I thought, okay, I'll, I'll share some of them in the context of, of love. Okay? So the first one is the one you don't talk about at church. Eros. Romantic. Passionate love. By the way, there's nothing wrong and sinful about this love. It, it however, is mostly self-oriented. If it gets out of bounds, it becomes lust. But the pleasure part of this is nothing wrong. It's a God-given gift. Doesn't happen to show up in the Bible except in the maybe in the creation story where Adam knew Eve and a boy was born. Okay, so it doesn't show up with a specific word, but this knowing kind of thing. So that's one sense of love. It's a, it's a lustful, passionate kind of love. It's a physical love. And, and uh, there you go. Now we've got this other one called mania. Uh, mania, we've heard that word like, uh, 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 like if there's a big event going on. Uh, you know, this, you know, I'm trying to think of a, something mania, WrestleMania. You know, you're going to have all kinds of wrestling. Come and see WrestleMania. And so there's this mania word, okay? Mania is actually an unhealthy, obsessive love. So not all loves are healthy. Mania would be an unhealthy, obsessive, it's like a stalker who loves an actor or an actress, but then stalks them inappropriately. And we've had stories of people that aren't quite right that have this kind of love that actually end up kidnapping or, or, uh, or killing someone that they actually, quote, love. This is the mania love. Doesn't show up in the Bible, aren't you glad? Okay, so uh, that, that's just, a, it's extreme jealous, it's violent. It kind of shows up in domestic violence. It shows up when a man, or it could be, a, you know, I guess these days, um, you know, there's, Violence at home, sometimes perpetrated from a male, sometimes perpetrated from a female. 
but it's, it's an inappropriate, obsessive love. It's the kind of love that, it, that demands you're going to love me whether you like it or not, and I'm going to force you to love me, so I'm going to control you in such a way. as a, that You see all the negativity there, right? And so we don't see that in our mothers. That's good. Now here's an interesting one. Ludus. Kinds of love. It's a, it's a healthy, playful love. Almost like, you know, it's like youthful, like um, having a crush or infatuation. Do you remember the movie Passion of the Christ? This is before the, like, the passion scenes. And the, it gives some scenes of like Jesus interacting with Mother Mary, with Mary. Remember the time he's like made a, made a table? And he makes a table and he's kind of like testing it out, how sturdy it is. He, maybe he begins to sit on it or, or he acts like he's got a chair and he's sitting at a table. And the way uh, uh, Mel Gibson wrote the movie, it's like they had, they had Mary go, uh, it'll never catch on. How, remember that little phrase? It'll never catch on. And there's that one little, there's this playful thing about Jesus kind of creating something and, and she says, uh, it won't catch on to sell, that kind of a thing. There's another where he's washing his hands. Remember he's washing his hands? And then he flicks the water in Mary's face. You don't remember this? You remember that part? He flicks it. He's just having fun. It's a playful love. It wasn't mischievous. Sometimes we do things that are mischievous that are wound, are wound people. But that splashing water in her face wasn't, wasn't wounding her. We've got to be careful with what we do in this playful types of things. Because you can hurt people doing that, right? So, uh, but this is like a, a playful infatuation. Uh, it's, like, you know, it's like your teenage... Should I go girl or boy? Your teenager comes home from school and says, I am in love. And you as a parent go, sure you are. That's this one. Okay, that's this one. Anyway, okay, so now we get into this next one. Pragma. It's another concept of love. This is an enduring love built on commitment, understanding, long-term best interest, patient, tolerant. It's a mature love. It's almost like the opposite. Not, not, it's like a contrast to the other one. The other one's this youthful, I'm in love, but I don't care who knows it. What movie is that from? Elf. Okay, so. Um, but now this is the kind of love where, do you remember me telling you I was uh, Billy Graham's hospice chaplain. I had the honor of being Billy Graham's hospice chaplain. And I would go into a particular facility and I would find every day Billy Graham sitting with his wife, Thelma. And he was, he visited her. He didn't live there. She lived there. And he held his arm, and they would sit there for hours. Every time I went there, they were there in the corner in this little love seat. And, and I'm thinking, actually, I'm holding my arm up like this right now. I'm already feeling my arm go to sleep. Just hold it right here for a couple seconds. I feel my arm going to sleep. I'm trying to imagine how my arm, what my arm would feel like after, after a whole afternoon of sitting there like this. You know what that is? That's this kind of love. Committed. You think he felt good about that? Oh, he did. But it wasn't like playful. And it wasn't like dramatic emotional. This was commitment kind of love. It's the kind of love that you do when you take your mother once again to the doctor's. Right? It's an important love, isn't it? It's a kind of love this world could use more and more. Especially when 50% of our, of our marriages fall apart and, you know, that kind of thing. Th this kind of love would really come in handy, wouldn't it? Yes, yes, indeed. It's a, it, 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 that word is not used in the Bible, but it, it's, it's a good kind of love. This next one. Do you know how to pronounce that? Delausia? That could be it. It's an, an appropriate love for self. 
This is not the word used in the New Testament, but we are to love others as we love ourselves. This self kind of love in the Bible, we're supposed to love ourselves. And in fact, there's this sense in which that when we have a healthy, appropriate love for ourselves, we are in a posture to be a better lover of others. And so this is a, it's an important love. But then if it becomes unhealthy or obsessive, we have a word for that, we call it narcissism. When you're all self-absorbed, when it's, everything's about you, and you got to have your way, you got to look just right, everything is like, it's, it's just everything is, that is an unhealthy kind of love. So be careful about how you view yourself. Accept and love yourself just the way you are. When you start to make yourself become something, just so others might love you, you begin to, you begin to pass into an unhealthy kind of a, strange kind of a thing. But love for yourself is an important love. And it's good. Don't let it get too much. I mean, I'm a pretty good guy. In fact, I'm, I'm great. In fact, I'm fantastic. In fact, I, I think I'm the best there ever was. I am God's gift to... Now, somewhere I started out good and I went bad there, right? Somewhere something went wrong. Okay, so this can go wrong. It might can go wrong fast. So um, anyway, there you go. Store J or store gay. This is the family love. It's the love you have before you even have your child born. You're expecting a baby. You're... Your kids are expecting a child. You're expecting a grandchild, or some of you maybe a grand, great grandchild. Are you going to love that child? Well, I don't know. I'm going to wait and see how it comes out, and see how well behaved, and what kind of job, and how he cuts his hair, and then I'll decide whether or not I'm going to love that child. No, 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 no. This kind of love is, hey, your family. Welcome, your family. Come on in, your family. It's almost, it's a sense of love. Not only it's a blood family, but. Um, Norm! Where'd that come from? Cheers! Well, of course. He's part of that family at the Cheers, the group of people that gather together at the, you know, their, their family in that sense. That's a, that's a certain kind of love. They're not, blood, they're not blood family, but there's something. This patriotism is a kind of this love. Or like, how about them Tigers? They actually won yesterday. Hey, okay, we like, we have a certain something for the Tigers. But those, how about those Yankees? Oh, those, those adjective Yankees. You see, we don't like the Yankees. You see, we don't love the Yankees, we love the Tigers, or the Reds. In your case, the Reds. Okay, but um, anyway, you get that. Okay, but this is the mother's love. That's a natural kind of love. It's a father's love. It's the kind of love that's it's for, our fam- it's for our brothers and sisters. It's, uh, this is interesting. One of my best friends growing up, I don't even know if he, he actually, he, uh, he came, he, he, I think he might watch. Wade, if you're watching, I'm talking about you and your brother, Kevin. Uh, Wade was my friend. We did, uh, you know, we did all the playing football, baseball, everything in the yard, played hockey, basketball, you know, all the neighborhood stuff that you do. Well, Wade, Wade's younger brother was Kevin. Well, Wade would always kind of push Kevin around, treat him bad, and like I said, and I'm seeing, oh, that's how you treat Kevin. So I start pushing Kevin around, and, and then, then Wade comes up to me and says, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm saying I'm, pu- I'm pushing Kevin around because you push Kevin. No, I can push him around. He's my brother. You can't push him around. I got the message. Isn't that interesting? Family love is a weird kind of a thing. You love each other, you hate each other, you fight with each other, you kick and scream, but you know what? Ducks stick together. There's something about a team. There's something about a family. There's something about this kind of love that... And then in the Bible it's used twice, so it it basically says, don't be unloving to your family. Don't be unloving to your church family. 
We need this kind of love in the church. And the Bible says, don't not have this kind of love for one another. You see, you might love your family at home, but when you get to the church, you don't have to love each other the same because we're not blood family. Spoiler alert, I just thought of Dusty Pocken. Spoiler alert. No, in the church, didn't we just sing a song that God has, given, God has done something and we are all sons and daughters. I am a child of God. You're a child of God. We, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the fam. Who's ever heard that song before? The family of God. Thanks for joining me. I like, it's been like forever since that. We used to sing that all the time at our, at our home church. The family of God. That's who we are. We love each other this way. Now, I don't know how it fits when like the older ones among us push around the younger ones. But how do we stick up for one another when we see someone else pushing around somebody else in the family? See, we're all family. So we can all push each other around a little bit. But we can all stand up for each other as well. And I don't know how that all works out in the course of what it means to be a church. I have offended people at times. I don't recall ever intentionally offending somebody, but I have offended people and they have come to me and told me. I didn't mean to offend, but I did offend. Maybe there's been times when I've had visits with people where I have had an issue with them and maybe I offended them because I, I broached a situation. I hate those conversations. How many hate those conversations? I hate those. Uh, and you know, over the years, <laughs> believe it or not, I've had some of, some of you visit me in my office and do a little of that and I want to thank you for that. Thank you for coming to me and confronting me. I said something, I did something that I, that I shouldn't have done. You come to me, and, and that's a good thing, isn't it? That's a good thing. It's, it, it's never easy. It's never easy. I hate it. I avoid it like the plague. But when you have to do it, you have to do it because love requires this kind of stuff. Because we need this kind of love. And when it's not there, something's wrong with the church family. So uh, there's, there's that. Now, okay, so now here's a biblical word. Phileo, phileia, you've heard this. What's the city of brotherly love? Philadelphia. Okay, so, uh, so what do you think Adelphos means? Brother. Okay, so just like, you know, Philadelphia. So, uh, okay, so now this word, phileo, philia, is used 25 times in the New Testament. It means affection. It's a non-sexual love. You, you know, go to the first one for that, for that one. But it's an authentic friendship. Close. I mean, how many, you just look around in this room, how many of us have meaningful, affectionate friendships with, with, other, with others among us? Or you think about people that don't come to this church, but they're just a neighbor or, or a longtime friend, co-worker. You know, I mean, you're somebody that's just a friend, Right? A friend. There's acquaintances, right? We, we got many more acquaintances, fewer friends, and sometimes if we just have one solid, authentic, phileo friend, that that is wholeness to many of us. Just one, just one. Let's be that for somebody else, right? But you know what's hard to be? It's hard to be that for everybody. If it's for everybody, then it's more an acquaintance. It's more like a phileo. It's, it's more like the uh, the storge love. It's for everybody. Okay, this one, this phileo love, is, is like the ones you draw close to. You have affection for your your natural natural inclinations for other people, kind of a thing. And it's not it's not inappropriate at all. It's it's good. It, it's, and when it really this is the the challenge is to have both this and storge working together. Okay, phileo, when it's working amongst a group of people, it can be criticized when it's misunderstood or hard to break into. We might call that phileo group, we might call it a 
click. What do we mean by click? We mean like, well, they have good friendships and fellowships there, but you can't break into it. You can't become a part of it. Ay, that's painful. That's hard, isn't it? Okay, so let us not, let us develop phileo, you know, philia. Let us have this philia love a lot. Let us do it. Don't, don't let the criticizers stop your filleting one another. <laughs> not fishing. <laughs> yeah, the filleting. No, don't, don't let people's criticism that they can't become part of it stop you from being it. But if you're in a group that's filleting, filleting, whatever you want to say, call there, then start adding some storge to that too. Because if you can have philia and storge in a small group, then there is an outward welcome because others break into the group. Well, they are family too. So this storge is a good thing. Philia is a, a, a good thing. And we are encouraged to have this kind of love. Do you remember when Jesus confronted Peter? He's restoring him. This is after the resurrection. They go fishing. The miraculous catch of fish. Jesus makes breakfast. And then he pulls Peter aside. And he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. He was hurt that Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And, and Peter says, Lord, I love you. This is what's interesting in this. Here's how this goes. Peter, do you agape me? That's our next word. Peter says, I phileo you. Peter comes back and says, Peter, do you agape me? Peter goes, I phileo. I have an affection, an authentic friendship. I have close feel. I phileo you. And then Jesus, the third question is, Peter, do you phileo me? And that's where he was hurt. And he said, Lord, you know I phileo you. Isn't that interesting? Jesus asked, do you agape? Do you agape? Do you phileo? Peter's answer was, I phileo, I phileo, I phileo. Jesus shifted his question. Is it bad to have this philia love for Jesus? No. No. It is a good thing. Even like this morning when we're worshiping and praising, we're, we're developing this phileo love. We're, we're calling out. There's this, there's this affection. There's this, it, it affects our emotions, doesn't it? And for me, when the Lord seems to show up and come close to me, I, I, sh I begin to shed a tear. I, I, I tend, and some of you, you can hear it. You go, woo! Or, you know, or you shout out, like, Kathy's trying to get us to do, uh, which is which is good. <laughs> maybe one day, maybe one day. But you know, my, you know, we all show it a little bit differently. But uh, when the Lord draws close, it affects our affections. It, 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 we, it, we feel some emotion, but that is not the strength of the of the love of God. It's it's a wonderful, authentic relationship. If you have a sense of. You know, not everyone's emotional the same. We're all different. We're all wired differently. And it, but that was an important message. There are no accidents. Ponder this. By the way, I will say this since it's Mother's Day and remembering my mom. I didn't grieve my mom right away. Like, I didn't, like, grieve. Like, I, I didn't, like, get emotional right away. You, you ever had, like, I didn't, you know, like, I was keeping it together, you know, getting those service together. I, I, I had some ideas for to share with uh, Joel and ask him if he'd do this and this. And I was thinking about my sisters and, you know, and then it's, then I was thinking about, I don't want to take mom to the doctor anymore. You know, all, all this kind of stuff. So um, I, I, I hate to say that. I'm just being honest. I miss it. 
now, but then it was like, but I don't know why I didn't, I started to worry about what, you don't love your mother? You know, because I, I wasn't emotional. But it was a couple months later, six, seven, we don't remember the date, but that song was sung at a worship service. And where it goes, from my mother's womb, you have chosen me. It's like, for whatever reason, that was my moment. And in fact, every time that song is sung, it reminds me of the moment I grieved my mother, where it got emotional, I couldn't hold back the emotion, and, and it was a therapeutic cry. Have you had a therapeutic cry for your losses? It's important. It's okay, that kind of a thing. But that's because I had a, I had a love for my mother that was appropriate. You have a love for your mother, your mother, your, your friends, your family, all that kind of stuff. It's important love. Now, you knew when I said those eight, eight words of love, you knew that we were going to land here. How many knew we were going to land at Agape? Yes. You notice that, that phileo was used 25 times in the New Testament. Agape is used 116 times. I know we're not scientists, we're not rocket scientists and all that, but there's a word used 25 times in the New Testament and a word used 116 times. In the, which one seems to take priority? The one used multiple, okay, okay, so, that, so this, is, this is that one. This is the selfless love. It's actually a non-emotional love. It does, you know, you might not feel affection for God, but still love God. That's good. That's, that you're getting into agape. Agape is not confused with emotions. Agape is not confused with affections. And that's why some of you can worship God in the midst of people wailing and crying and screaming and kicking. You're sitting there stoic because your love for God is, you know, might be more like this in, in the, the affection of God, which is appropriate. And that's not a criticism at all. Maybe you could use a little bit of that. You know, it's, if, if you have difficulty having affections for others, that's more a sign of unhealth than it is a sign. Now, if you're blubbering baby all the time, then that's a sign of unhealth also. You know, so it's like you get, you get this balance of all these things. Balance is key, but this agape is selfless, universal, unconditional love. It's the most used word for God's love and what all believers are called to emulate. All believers in Christ are called to emulate this. Okay, I mentioned the scripture. It's noon already. Can you believe it? I need to at least read the Bible. Read the Bible. I told myself, and go fast through those eight words. But I didn't go that fast today. I said, go fast and get to this. All right, here's the, here's the scripture. Jesus says, and by the way, pick out what word is being used here multiple times. Okay? I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already be clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. we got to pile out back. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. The word remain is used 11 times in the 10 verses we just read. Wait a minute. 
this whole thing you've been focused on love and it didn't show up once. Isn't this intriguing? Jesus is doing a teaching before he goes up to the cross and he's, he's instructing his disciples what's critical, what's important. And he starts with this remaining, you got to be in, you got to abide, you got to dwell, you got to be with me, be with me, be with me, be in me, be, in, be connected, be connected, be connected, remain, stay, don't go, endure, all that kind of stuff. Eleven times in ten verses, that's, that's, that's an emphasis, wouldn't you say? Say yes, that's an emphasis. Now we go to the second part of this teaching. The next verse. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. By the way, every one of these words is agape. Every one of them is agape. Now remain, there it is, in my love. There's the central verse of this whole thing. Remain, used 11 times in the first half, remain and then we're going we're gonna to have agape is used eight times in nine verses at the end. Remain in my love. Eleven times, eight times merged together. This is the focus. It's clearly the focus. Remain. So I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you remain in my agape. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his agape. I have told you this so that my joy may be complete in you and that your joy may be complete. I'm not going to get into that, but that's a really good verse. My command is this, agape each other as I have agape you. Greater agape has no one than this to lay down his life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know what his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. By the way, we learned after the resurrection, he called them brothers and sisters. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. There's the whatever you may ask. Is repeated. So whatever you ask is in the end of the first section. It's at the end of the second section. Whatever you ask, you'll get. Whatever you ask, you ask anything in my name, you'll have it. Ask whatever. So, so there's something in this that's all connecting together. If you, get, if, you, if you get this. This is my command. Here it is. Agape each other. Okay? This is the command. What's a command? I'm suggesting for all you. No. If you are going to be my disciple, there is no choice. If you're going to choose to be my disciple, you will agape all people. If you don't want to agape all people, don't be my disciple. It's a command. It's like, oh. Well, I don't feel like loving. It's not about feeling. There's not emotion in agape. Meno is the primary word for to stay. And, that's, and that is used 118 times in the New Testament. Did you just, did, did something go, did you do one of those 118 times? Wait a minute. Agape is only used 116 times. And remain is used more frequently, 11 times in this passage, than agape was used. If we were doing a comparison, 118, 116, they're pretty close, aren't they? These are both very much connected. And I don't know if the Holy Spirit was keeping count when he was inspiring scripture. Maybe he lost track of one. Uh, it's, forgive me. Forgive, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't. But this, this concept of abide, remain, continue, tarry, endure in the Lord. Abide in Christ. Stay in Christ. Remain in Christ. That is as important as love. And in fact, the whole idea is this. In order to love agape, 
unconditional love, love for all people, meaning your neighbor, yourself, your spouse, your family, your, 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 and your enemy, all people. You know those, those people that are of a different political agenda than you and I are? Those people too. They're to love us. We're to love them as Christians. Do you agree with all Christians? You, we don't all agree. What does agape have to do with agreeing? Nothing. Agape is I will agape you whether you like it or not. I'm going to love you whether you like it or not, whether you reciprocate or not. Or if you are just going to be loved by me. That's the way it is. Get used to it. But do I? Do you? To the degree, here's the thesis, to the degree that I remain and dwell in Christ. To that degree I will love as Christ. To the degree that Christ is in me, to that degree I will lay down my life for my friends. I'm not going to lay down my life for anybody. What's your problem? You're not remaining in Christ. <laughs> because if you remain in Christ, you can't help but produce fruit. And if you don't produce fruit, he'll cut you off so that the church does produce fruit. Well, that was in the first half. I'm sorry, I took so much time explaining love and I got all this other stuff to do. The first half is about remaining in Christ. The second half is about agape or remaining in Christ's love. Verses 7 and 16 have something important in common. Verse 7 talks about you can ask whatever you want in his name. It will, it will be done. Verse 16 says, whatever you ask, the Father will give you. Isn't that very similar? So there's a connection here. As we remain in Christ, as we remain in his love, the Father is engaging in answering whatever comes to your mind to pray about. Now, Let's go back to a different kind of love. Let's go back to the, which one you want to pick on? Let's go with the eros love. You know, the sexual, lustful, pleasurable one. Oh God, I want eros. How's the answer to that prayer? You don't need God to involve you in that. You can rebel against God and have all kinds of that. See, this agape happens in Christ. And when we're in Christ, God births desires. And the desires that he births, he will give you the desires of your heart. The desires of your heart will be shaped by your remaining and your loving agape. We got to come to a conclusion. Do you want, how did I lose my place here? Do you want your prayers answered affirmatively? Which love answers all those questions? There's a whole list of love. Which one does? Which one gets the answers? And of course you know. It's agape. The final question we leave with is, 